Chapter 7, the verses are 11 through 16. Let me thank those who are listening by way of internet and streaming. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Shermai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048 USA. Thank you for joining us within our morning service. Our scripture for today is Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 16. Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 16. When you found it, you will discover these words. Now it happened the day after that when he went into the city called Nain, and the many of his disciples went with him in a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open casket or coffin and those who carried him stood still and he said young man I say to you arise so he who was dead set up and began to speak and he presented him to his mother then fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet had risen, has risen up among us, and God has visited his people. I want to talk about arise. 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 All right. Make it plain. Make it plain. Today, 
in Park Ridge, Florida, mm. many family members, friends, and neighbors are blown away. Mm -hmm. They are amazed. They are in situations that they thought they would never be in. Yeah, yeah. Whenever mothers and fathers are burying their children, it's a tough situation. We're used to uh, mothers being buried by their children. We're used to fathers being buried by their children. But in Florida this morning, mourning is going on. Children have been shot up in a school where they walk in, where one has walked in heavily armed and took the lives of innocent children. One father reflects on the moment and he says he sent his daughter to a school, a place where he thought she would be safe. He moved upon her to attend school regularly, a place that he thought would be a safe haven. But this morning, that father and many other family members moaned the death of their children. Yeah, yeah. Most of us in this room and on the air cannot imagine the pain, cannot imagine the suffering that parents, brothers, sisters, and family members are going through this morning. We have to make sure that we as a family Show love toward each other. Children have to love their parents. Parents have to love their children. And it's not enough to just love them. But we have to show love and say love toward them. I know there are some people who were reared in homes where love and affection wasn't the first thing on the agenda in the morning. Neither was it on the agenda all day long. But love and affection has to be carried out because you never know when it's your last moment. Amen. You can be, as some of them, 14-year-olds, 17-year-olds, having a bright future and have declared that my best days are ahead of me. I'm getting ready to graduate. I'm getting ready to make a mark in history. I'm getting ready to do great things in my life. And I just know that when I get to college, great things are going to happen. Yeah, yeah. These children will never experience a college campus. Right, yeah. These children will never be able to experience a real workforce. All right. They will never be able to experience 401k or retirement. They will never be able to experience saying, I've worked for 50 years and now I'm going to sit down and do what I want to do, when I want to do it, the way I want to do it. These children will never have that opportunity because the devil is as a roaring lion walking to and fro trying to find somebody that he can devour. It doesn't matter what the color is. It doesn't matter what the background looks like. Children's lives are valuable to us. In the text, the picture is painted. Jesus is leaving the scene of a centurion soldier that he had just healed. And he finds his way to a city called Nain. And while he's in this city called Nain, he is walking through the city. And when he near the gate of the city, behold, there's a dead man. And this dead man is being carried out of the gate. This dead man is being moved from, from death into the grave. This dead man is, is being carried to, to make his way to his final resting place. But the good thing about it, Jesus was on the scene. All right. I just want to stop right here. And if you get nothing else from the message, regardless of what your situation is, Regardless of how dead your situation is, when Jesus is on the scene, there's a chance for a miracle. Whenever Jesus, whenever Jesus is on the scene, there's an opportunity for miracles to take place. Whenever Jesus is on the scene, you need to 
to make sure if he's not grown, he has not grown close to you, you need to make sure you draw close to him. What is it in your life that's dead? Your career? Dead. Your relationship with your parents? Dead. Your relationship with your children? Dead. Your situation at home? Dead. Spouse has caused you to be in a dead situation. Children have, have upset you and now you're in a dead situation. What situation about you that's dead? I contend that everybody listening to my voice has at one time had a dead situation. I, I contend that at one time your situation was so bad until you just deemed this dead and walked away from it. This man was dead. The woman, the woman that was there, his mother, was going to the burial site to bury her son. Much like many in Florida are doing this morning, they are headed to the burial site. Sometime this week, they're headed to the burial site. And some of them have been headed to the burial site already. We need to understand that regardless of what goes on, the songwriter says to us this morning, is already getting better. It's already getting better. It's already getting easier. You see, what we have to understand, even in our dead situation, Jesus is able to bless us and make us alive again. There are some situations going on here. First of all, the man is dead. It didn't say that he, he died in a car accident. It didn't say if his horse turned over. It didn't say if his donkey ran over him. It didn't say whether somebody shot and killed him. He's dead. Let me tell you something. We get all excited when folk die certain ways, but when the person is dead, guess what they are? They are just dead. There's no more heartbeat. There's no more blood being pumped from one extremity to the other. They are just dead. Yeah. And none of us in this room want to wish death on anybody. Nobody wants to feel the pain that they feel today in Florida. No one wants to feel the pain of, of sending your child to school and that child never comes back to you. It's tragic. It's mind-boggling. It is amazing. And some people, no doubt this morning, is asking the question, where is God and where was God in the situation? Let me just tell you, God was in the school when I was in elementary school, but we put him out of the school, and since we have put him out of the school, all hell has been breaking loose ever since. I'm not a big advocate of prayer in the school because when you are a Christian, you ought to pray anyhow. You, you ought to pray anywhere. You ought to pray anyway. Yeah, yeah. But we have legislated Christ to get out. We have pushed him out. We have ushered him out. We have moved him out. And not only have we, some of us, not only moved him out of the school, some of them have moved him out of our house. Yeah. Some of us have moved him out of our business. Yeah. Some of us have moved him out of our day-to-day -day routine. And because we have moved him out of our routine, now our situation is a dead situation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's when tragedy hit like this that the United States, all over the United States, come to church on Sunday. They go to prayer visuals. They flock all over the place. The good thing about that is at least they know where to run. The problem is when you get in trouble and you don't know where to run, that's a problem. The problem is when you hurt and you don't know where to run, that's a problem. The problem is when situations get so bad until you want to turn your back on God, that is a problem. It's a problem when you shake your fist at God. And tell God, God, you should have been there. God, you shouldn't have let it happen. And I know folk go through all kinds of emotions during these situations. And, and we are thankful to God for our children being on top of the ground and the ground not on top of, of them. It doesn't matter how bad they are. It doesn't matter how much trouble they get into. It doesn't matter if they're knuckleheads or not. We love our children. But we have to get to a point where we show love. Yeah, yeah. 
We exemplify love. All right. We do things that are loving things. And sometimes love is tough. Sometimes you have to say no when you really want to say yes. All right. Sometimes you have to hold back when you really want to say go. Sometimes you have to stop when you're all, already on your way to do something. What you have to understand is love is not always yes, yes, and yes. Right. Sometimes love is no. All right. Get it, get it. We have to show love. We have to show love. And, and we have to show love in a way that everybody around us know we love each other. You see, if family members would show love more often, then, then folk wouldn't think they can get in and, and turn one against the other. If family members would just be, be close. Let me tell you, thieves are thick. And family members are not as thick as thieves are. But if we get as thick as thieves are, then no one can pull us apart. We need to come to a point in our lives where we forget what they did at grandmama's funeral 20 years ago. We need to forget what has been, been turned off and what has been turned on. We need to forget about what somebody said and what somebody done and make sure that we love and show love. Because our time is limited. Our time is short. And it's just as many short grades or there are long grades. So you need to understand that love ought to be on your agenda. The Bible says you ought to love God as you love yourself. Love God first. Put him first. And then love your neighbors as you love yourself. You ought to love God with all your might, all your heart, and with all your substance. You ought to love the Lord. And God knows when you love him. The text that I looked at, that I looked to change, if, if you notice, I have a demonstration on, on the stage that I, I changed the message totally because I want you to make sure that you love. The, 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 the text that I was looking at for this morning was uh, that we need to be fruitful and we need to multiply and we need to always be real with our fruit. We ought to show love. Folk know when you fake in love. People know when love is not really on your agenda. You can do that Sunday school hug, that church hug, all you want to. Folk understand when you don't really love them. Love. A whole community comes out when tragedy strikes. But we have to get to a point that we don't wait on tragedy. Let our neighbors know how much we really care for them. Stand by them. We can't stand by and watch our neighbor's house get broken into and don't even call the law. We have to love each other and we have to love each other with the copy type of love, the love that God loves us. And God loves us in spite of us. In spite of our meanness, in spite of our condition, God yet loves us. And if you would really testify the truth, because some people test the lie. But if you would really testify the truth, you would know and you would tell folk, I messed up and I'm torn up from the floor. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You see, in church, we, we act like we got together because we've been, we've been, uh, we've been, Brother Charles, we've been, we've gotten to a point in our lives, Brother Charles, where we, we've been faking it so long until wrong began to look like right. Yeah. And we, we, we fake it so long until we know the routine. 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 We come in on Sunday. We do the devotion. We, 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 we have a, a fellowship period. And during the fellowship period, we exemplify love and we show love. But if we see each other in the grocery store, we go the other way. That's not love. Right. That's right. That's right. Fake. Fake. If we can hug at church, we ought to be able to hug in the supermarket. If we stand with each other in church, and we know in this church, we already know that if anybody comes in the room, y'all going to look to me to help you out. You've already come to the conclusion. Pastor David's got it all figured out. He's going to make sure that we all are safe here because he's reminding us on, on a regular basis that he's reminding us on a regular, on a huge regular basis that he's ultimately responsible for everything that goes on at the New Beginning Church. And if anything goes on, even if it's just cussing, you're going to look to me because you believe that I got an answer for it. 
Children look to their parents because they believe that parents have an answer for everything. Now, children may not want you to kiss them in front of their friends. They don't want you to hug them when you drop them off at school because, oh, mom, oh, daddy, that, that's not good. But when bullets start flying, they will run to you because they're looking for you to protect them. Now, you may be old and to barely make it, but they're looking for you to protect them. We have to be loving. And if you can't buy love somewhere, you need to practice love. And, and maybe you'll get good at it sooner or later. Love ought to be on your agenda. In the text, this woman loved her child. She loved him. And, and now he's dead. She's going to the grave to bury her child. But the good thing about it, Jesus shows up. You need to keep Jesus in your household. You ought not put him out. You ought not excommunicate him. You need Jesus as a part of your household. How do I put Jesus there? You must be born again. You have to be born again. You got to be born again. Not running, shouting, rolling in the floor, speaking in other tongues. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about believing the story that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a bar or two. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. And believing and trusting that story makes you saved, born again, and makes you a Christian. The next thing you got to do is spend some time with him. Some fellowship time with him. You yeah. need to spend some time with him. You need to spend some time with him. I told Sister Davis last night when she got home, you know she gone. Y'all need to talk to her about this. She, she's gone every Valentine's Day, Brother Miles. I mean, she, if Valentine's Day doesn't fall on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, Sister Woods, she, she's out of here. I mean... Every year this time. I, I don't know what, yeah, I do know where she's going, but, but she's out of here. And I said to her last night, this time was different than ever before. It's because my love is growing and it's becoming sweeter and sweeter round by round. And if it's becoming sweeter and sweeter round by round, Deacon Roberts, you ought to let her know it's becoming sweeter and sweeter. You ought to tell her it's becoming sweeter and sweeter. And don't just give her flowers on Valentine's Day. Amen. Some women don't even want flowers, so don't give her what she wants. Don't want it. If she doesn't want it, don't give her. I mean, man, that's a lot of money on Valentine's Day. The only good thing about Sister Davis going out of town on Valentine's week, I get to buy cheap flowers for that Saturday evening. <laughs> It, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother my budget at all. It does not upset the household because the flowers go back. The same $80 and $100 flowers go right back down to $25 by the time she gets back home. But it ought not be flowers just on Valentine's Day. We ought to show love to each other every day of the week. We, we ought to fix breakfast for them. We ought to walk them to the car. We, we ought to open their doors. We ought to pinch them on the cheek. We ought to show that stuff you did before you got married. Hanging out in the park, walking and holding hands and going walking together. It doesn't cost money to show folk love. It costs money to get in trouble. Brother Isaiah, it costs money to get in trouble. I'm trying to stop them from talking. I've called both of them names twice, and they just kept right on. Now i got to put it all over the World Wide Web. Brother Isaiah and Brother Charles still just talking. And I'm doing it out of love. The text says that the boy was dead, and they were taking him out of the city, and they got to the gate of the city, and behold, he was already dead. And as they carried out. Remember, he was the woman's only son. Yeah. He was the only son of his mother. Mm -hmm. she, he was the only son the mother had. She didn't have another son. And, and some folk have this philosophy. You need to have several children because if one of them dies, you still have one. God is still in control regardless of what you have. Right. But this was this woman's only son. And no daughter can take the place of a son. It was her only son. It, it was the son that she had. And now she don't have him anymore. Yeah, yeah. 
The agony, the pain, the frustration that went with this woman in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 16, this was this woman's only son. So she had support. There was a crowd of folk following. Whenever somebody dies, folk, you can, folk who won't visit you when you're living will follow you when you're dead. Folk that won't come to church when they're living and their family members are living, they will show up when they're dead. Yeah. And they come to church acting all spiritual and Holy Ghost filled and haven't seen the spirit of the Lord in the last 20 years. But they show up. Yesterday I was talking to a pastor and he was talking about the fact that one of his cousins got up at his grandmother's funeral and his grandmother was was a lady that was always in church. They were all, she was always doing things for the Lord, always doing things for the people. And you know, it's terrible when church folk, when church, it's terrible when a non-church person get up in church and try to speak. A non-church cousin of his got up and said, oh, big mama's up there with Tupac now. <laughs> you're laughing because you're a church person. You can't expect those who are not flocking the church to act like they're in the church and to act like their church is in them when it's time for them to stand before the church. That's why at the New Beginning Church, we, we said all, all funerals the same way. In the morning, we let all of them come in and they start talking and we let them talk for a full hour while the family's there. They talk. Anybody can get up and say anything they want to say to the family for one full hour. You don't have to obey the three-minute rule at all. Just talk for one full hour. If one person get up and talk for an hour so bad on you all, y'all let him talk for one full hour. So during the viewing process, they are able to talk to the family for one full hour. All right. You can exchange talkers or one person can talk. And guess what? Some funerals, one person try to talk the whole hour. Because when it gets to the funeral celebration, we ought to be able to celebrate with what, without folks saying crazy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And pastors sometimes become lenient at the funeral simply because they like one person over the other. One lady got up to sing a song and she was singing a secular song. It couldn't happen at the New Beginning Church. But the pastor just let her go on and she messed up. And the moment she messed up, she started cussing. And then she said, ooh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, first of all, you can't expect an unspiritual person to do spiritual things. And you can't, and once they start doing unspiritual things, you got to know that unspiritual stuff will follow. Yeah, yeah. We had a lady come by our church one, one year during the summer camp, and she was teaching the children a song, and then she started showing the children what to do, and she was teaching them how to drop it like it hot. Don't you know whoever the director was at that time got an earful for me? Because we don't drop it like it's hot here. There are too many spiritual songs that artists have written so long and so have spent so much time with the Lord over that we can sing spiritual stuff and teach our children spiritual things. We don't have to go get anything that's of, of the world to pray in the end of God. But the moment we let a little bit creep in, and we let a little bit more creep in. And we let a little bit more. And then that one live church becomes a dead church. It was once alive, but now it's a dead church. And you, you wonder what happened. Well, if the pastor had to let her do what she wanted to do, folk would still come to church. Let me tell you something. If people are so immature about their spiritual walk that they will quit because they get rebuked, then I don't want the dead weight on our church anyway. Rebuke. The Bible says the pastor's called to rebuke. Jesus shows up and he rebukes death. The Bible says the people stood still that were carrying the casket. And it says Jesus walks up. And when Jesus walks up, he puts his hand into an open casket. He touches the open casket or the open coffin. He touches it. And whatever Jesus touched, <laughs> it lives again. It doesn't matter how dead it is. Anything that Jesus touched, it continues to live. 
I'm standing to you this morning to rise. Jesus says to him, arise. He saw the woman, saw her torment, saw her frustration, saw her misery, and the Bible says he had compassion on her. He had compassion. He, you see, pity is what you do when you see somebody and you just say, oh, I have pity on you. Or you feel sorry for them, that's pity. Compassion is when you see somebody in trouble, somebody in need, and you rush to attend to the need. When you see somebody going through some things, when you see somebody uh, going through some things that, and even when you don't know what to say, that's why we visit folks when, they're, when they're, their loved one passed away. Sometimes somebody visits people and they just make matters totally worse. To be honest with you, folk really don't want to hear what you have to say a lot when they're going through. They just want you there to spend time with them. They just want you there so when they do have somebody, they, they can look to. They, they just want you there so when they start going through their emotional issues, they'll have somebody to blow up on. Have you ever been there for somebody and they just blew up on you? It's the emotions coming out. They don't really mean that to you. They just looking for somebody to blow up on. And because you're the closest one to them, they know they can blow up on you. And in the morning you will call them back and say, are you all right? Uh -huh. yeah. In the text they had professional mourners. <laughs> These folk were professional mourners. They knew how to mourn. Yeah. They, know, they knew when to grow. All of these professional mourners are walking around, falling behind this casket. The Bible said it was a large multitude, it was a large crowd of people, but Jesus shows up and cut off their mourning. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been around a person who wants to have an own little pity party? And it's usually the same person. And it's usually the same time of the month, or the same time of the week. Or the same hour of the day, they want to have their pity party. Yeah. And if you at work and everybody's complaining and you join with them, you just have the pity party too. Yeah. But the problem is, when you join in with them, you don't show your faith in God. Because when you have faith in God, you're not concerned about what you see. You're concerned about what you don't see. Yeah. Jesus walks up and says, stop your weeping. Yeah. Yeah. Stop your crying. Now y'all know, and y'all, some of you told me before, it's all right to cry at a funeral. Yes, it is. But it's not all right to put on a show at a funeral. That's right. That's right. It ain't all right. You knew before Big Mama died, you knew that she was closer to her grave than she was to her birth. Yeah. You knew that sooner or later this person is going to pass away. And because you're spiritual, you understand that God never makes a mistake. And because God never makes a mistake, there's no problem with God doing what God is going to do. And when it becomes a reality and it really hits you, you need to wonder one thing. Did I do everything that I'm supposed to have done in order for this person to see Jesus when they leave here? But you got some folk. Oh, let me get in there. God, you should have took me. Oh, get me in there. I mean, just a plumb show. And all you got to do is look at the history and you will see that they didn't have time for the dead person when the dead person was living. But it's usually the one who sits and, and trusts God. And they cry and, and they, they say, God is going to make it better. And it's already getting easier. You ought, to, you ought to look for the day that it will get easier. You ought to look for the day that it will get better. I was a videographer for a funeral where a boy died in a tragic way. He got shot by a neighbor because he was on some drugs. He got shot, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and the news reporter, you know, news reporter can really make things bad, and they make it bad for somebody other than the president, too. <laughs> and it's real news, not fake news. The news reporters were really making it bad for the household, for the parent, because they were talking about the boy as, as if they knew the boy. But because he was caught up on drugs, he went to the wrong house, and the man shot and killed, shot and killed him, and now we are preparing for the funeral. And I'm one of the videographers that's going to videotape the funeral. So we're getting ready to put together the PowerPoint presentation, and we're rolling music behind the pictures, and the music is very soft, 
very Christ-like music. This woman said, I don't like that music. I want you to put on this music. And the music she chose was some wheeling and wilding and crying and hollering and moaning music. So I concluded that people love being professional moaners. They, they love wallowing in their misery. And the thing about it, we couldn't even talk out of it. So when she got to church, she had that warning and wooting and wilding music, and the whole church got turned out because it was nothing positive about that moment. Jesus has compassion on this woman. He walks up, and he touched the open casket. He touched the open coffin. He, he touched it in and those who carried him stood still. Whenever Jesus shows up, he shows up with authority. And when he shows up with authority, everybody else around has to stand still because the Lord is working. If you had a grandmama like I had, whenever it starts storming outside, and don't let the report come up that it's a tornado, we used to get in that little trailer in the hallway in Mississippi, and she would say, sit down, boy. Be quiet, boy. And see, nowadays, people would have their, 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 their little iPad and all that stuff. If it was with my grandmama, you couldn't turn on an iPad. You couldn't turn on the TV. And then you wouldn't mouth back at her because she said, the Lord is doing his work. And when the Lord is doing his work, you stand still. The psalmist picked this thought up in Psalm 46 and 10. He said, be still and know that I am God. When God is at work, you don't have to go through all the gyrations. Just be still and know that I am God. I notice, I notice when, 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 when you call for an ambulance and when the, the paramedics get out the truck, they're moving very methodically. They are, everybody else is screaming and hollering in a hurry, but they are very structured, and, and they take their briefcase out very slowly, and they don't care what anybody else says. They are thinking about what they need to do once they get to the patient, and they don't get in a hurry. Everybody else is in an uproar. It's because they are qualified, and they know they're under control once they get to the patient. What we need to understand is that Jesus is qualified. And because Jesus is qualified, we got the right relationship with him. Trust what Jesus is doing. He may not be doing what you want. He may not be doing it the way you want him to do it. But trust what Jesus is doing. And just sing the song. It's already getting better. It's already getting easier. It's already God is working already. He's working on, on my behalf. I can't see it, but God is working behind the scene. I don't realize it, but God is at work behind the scene. Because God works well in dead situations. Yes, he does. He works well with dead situations. You think that boy calling up a fool's heel if you want to, just keep praying and calling on God. God works well in dead situations. You think that girl is lost for life? Let me tell you, just keep praying because God works well in that situation. If you think you are fruitless, just keep calling on God. Just keep trusting Jesus. Jesus works well in that situation. Says to the boy, young man, arise. Says arise. It means to move from a, a dead state to a live state. The text says that the boy sit up. He was laying down. He was dead. He had no heartbeat. He was dead. He had no, no blood flowing to his body. He was dead. He had no inhaling of, of oxygen and exhaling of carbon monoxide. He was dead, carbon monoxide. If you don't inhale oxygen, and eject carbon dioxide. You did. God has it all lined up. God puts a plant in your room. And the plant blesses you to live. The plant lets off pure oxygen. And you take in oxygen. And you eject carbon dioxide. And the plant takes in carbon dioxide. God got it already figured out. It's already getting easier. Is already getting better. Yeah, yeah. God has already risen you up on your behalf. Yeah. 
Right. He's blessing you in a way that you can't bless yourself. Yeah. The text says the dead man set up. He began to speak. That's why we ought to have a testimony. I was once dead and now I'm alive. What that means is I was once a prostitute and now I'm a missionary. I was once a dope dealer and, and now I'm a preacher. I was once disrespectful to my parents, but now I'm respectful to all those who are older than I am. I was once I was once had one with bad grades, but now I got good grades because I stood still when God touched my heart. Yeah, yeah. All right. I used to be a cusser, and I would cuss worse than a seaport sailor, but now I speak fruitfulness into people's lives. God has brought you to this point so you can arrive. And when you arrive, you ought to speak differently. You ought to act differently. You ought to carry yourself differently. Because if you don't carry yourself different, differently, folk are wondering, have God changed you? Yeah. All right. And you don't have to be a show. You don't have to tell people what you do. You don't have to go places then so people can see you doing what you do. Just stand still and watch what God does. He will use you in the midst of all that goes on around you. Bible says he sit up and he spoke. And Jesus gives him back to his mother. Jesus gives the boy. Why give him to his mother? Because the mother is the one that had compassion. He had compassion on. Because the mother is the one that was going through turmoil. The mother is the one that had endured with this boy. The mother is the one that was going through trouble with this boy. How many of y'all got some mothers that will go through some things because you put them through some things or the situation put them through some things? But one thing you can always call on, and that is mama, and some of us can call on that. Simply because this boy is now speaking. Jesus wanted to show this woman that the boy that was dead is now alive again. Then fear came over folk. You see, Jesus has a way of blessing us. And fear, our human character will fear what Jesus is doing with us. Because Jesus always put the super on the natural. So he gives us supernatural even when we are trying to walk in the natural. And then he said, and they glorified God saying we got a great prophet. This is the deal. You need to understand when you rise, you can't worry about who helped you to get there. You got to give glory to God. God uses instruments. God uses people to help you get where you need to be. But the fact of the matter is, you need to understand that God blessed you to get where you are. God has blessed you to do what you do. You ought to give glory to God. Last section says that God has visited the people. And when God visits the people, he's able to bless us in spite of us. You ought to be praying, God, visit your people. God, visit your people. Because when God visits the people, dead things come to life. When God visits the people, God is able to bless you in the courtroom and bless you in the hospital when God visits you. You ought to be praying, God, visit your people. That's why we ought to be praying for the White House right now. We ought to be praying. God visit. God visit the devil people and God visit your people. God visit the people. When God visits the people, the Bible teaches that he, he even visit those who are not in his corner. He even visit those that are not on his team. And when God visit those who are not on their team, the, the Bible declares that the leader, the ruler, his heart is in the hands of God. And God turns his heart like many rivers wherever he wants him to go. God's working behind the scenes. We just need to go vote. And once we do vote, watch what God does. I'm looking forward to see what God has to say. I'm looking forward to see what God has to do. And you may think that your situation is a dead situation. You may think that this great country that we live in is a dead country. I want to let you know that God works well with the dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ask Lazarus about it. Lazarus will tell you that God works well with the dead. Yeah. Lazarus will tell you that I was dead for four whole days. Jesus purposely waited till I died. But when Jesus came up, Lazarus, 
Lazarus, he says to me, Lazarus, come forth. And I got up. And then he told the folk, loose him and let him go. If you don't think God works well with the dead, ask the woman, the Shunammite woman, when, when Elijah was there. And he, he, he performed the very first uh, CPR. He laid and stretched himself over the boy. And the boy got up. The dead boy got up. God works well with the dead. If you don't believe me, just, just, just ask anybody who had a dead situation. And you knew it was dead. You knew it was out of here. And you knew it was gone. But God worked well with the dead. I'm telling you, God does great things. The question to you today is, are you dealing with something dead? And have you given it to Jesus? Because Jesus worked well with the dead. Over 2,000 years ago. Jesus was dead. He was fully dead. He was all the way dead. He was, he was out of here dead. And, and, and Jesus had already prophesied, in three days I will raise this temple up again. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus worked well with the dead. Yes, sir. <laughs> he got up from the dead. He, he rose after they killed him on Calvary. He got up from the dead. He got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. If you don't believe me, ask the boy in Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, there was a man running crazy in the graveyard. He was out of his mind. He was all the way dead in his heart. He was dead in his mind. Verse number 6 declares, but when he saw Jesus, he bowed down and worshipped him. God works well with the dead. Early that third day morning, Jesus got up from the dead. I stopped by to tell you one more time that Jesus is going to interrupt the dead one more time. One of these days, with the trump of God, at the sign of the voice of the angel, Jesus will raise those who believe from the dead. Paul declares it like this. Paul said, Paul says it like this, that one of these days, at the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who remain will be caught up with him in the day. We will rise from the dead, I tell you. We will be caught up with him because we trust the story. And one of these days, if you're tired of church down here, you better get it together because over there we're going to have church every day. We're going to have church from now on. We're going to rejoice with God from now on because he has raised us from the dead. Yeah. How you know you raised us from the dead, preacher? Because my life was dead. I was on my way to hell. I was out of here. But one of these days, God raised me from the dead. And on my way now, I'm on my way. Don't you want to go with me? I'm on my way to Beulah Land. I, don't you want to go with me? I'm on my way over to Zion. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm going when the trump of God sounds. It doesn't matter if I'm alive or I'm dead. Because on the other side, it's going to be howdy, howdy. No more goodbye. On the other side, God's going to bless us. And he's going to raise us one last time from the dead. The Bible says that I'm going to join in with the four pieces of creatures crying, holy, holy, holy. I'm going to join in with the 24 elders crying out to God. Blessed is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. I'm on my way today. I'm on my way to Beulah Land. I'm on my way to see Jesus because he has raised me from the dead. And because he's raised me from the dead, I'm glad about it. And I'm going to live the balance of my days telling men, women, boys, and girls that Jesus has raised me from the dead. Yes, and because he got up, he got up in my life one day. And when he got up in my life, he set me up for blessings to flow eternally. Will you come back and sing that song one more time for me? It's already, it's already getting better. It's, it's already getting easier. Can you quick? Can you move quickly? Move quickly. It's already, it's already, it's already getting better. It's already getting easier. It's, brothers, can y'all help them up? Brother Irvin, can you pass that napkin over there? Please. It's already, it's already getting better. It's, I want to say to those in Florida. Stay with the Lord. It's getting better. It's already. It's already getting better. Stay with the Lord. Stay with the Lord. It's, it's getting better. It's easier. It's getting easier. God's moving. He's moving on my behalf. And I thank him for it.
Thank you, God. Now we're at the point where we're getting ready to receive our offering. 